so so it, so it, the reality is you can, you can get these internships after a master's degree. Very few of them go that way. It seems particularly almost all the way down to the training. So it's been a little bit of educational translation. Concept to be able to engage live speakers. It's kind of like live music. Think of it that way. So, um, two couple of announcements is I, first, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting on uh, the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and we thank them for that. Uh, the, there is no grand rounds for December because I think we will all be you know, organizing other events in our lives around the same time that this would be happening here. Uh, but we do resume in January, so please watch uh, the feed for that. And I'm going to give a plug to another seminar that's happening today uh, at 12.30 in the basement, B151. Uh, Lila Steiner is going to be talking about cannabis, and so I think that you would be very interested in growing at home health and safety concerns for personal cannabis cultivation. So that's a, that's a little, that's a, a little uh, tagline uh, for that. I'm not saying anything. Is there treats? I think she, yeah, it was pretty good, Sam. Um, Another couple of announcements. You will see that uh, for our online audience, or for people here in the audience as well, if you um, tweet, you can tweet questions, and we will uh, take, uh, we will discuss that after uh, the talk. And if you are wanting to get uh, CE credits, that's the address that you go to. So, with those housekeeping details out of the way, um, I take great pleasure in. Uh, introducing our speakers today, and I asked them, <laughs> I asked them for short bios, and that's what they gave me. <laughs> Wonderful <laughs> short sweet bios. So our uh, speaker, Mr. Sterling Bryant, is an economist and a career-long specialization in healthcare. Professor at UBC's School of Population Public Health, and a senior scientist at uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation. So in 2016, he was appointed scientific director for the BC Support Unit, which we are about to hear a lot of, a uh, component part of BC's Academic Health Sciences Network, and focused on promoting patient-oriented research. I'm also going to present his side, uh, but better half, Allison Holmes. And Allison is the Knowledge Translation Specialist for the Methods Cluster of the BC Support Unit, and has been in the field of KT for almost a decade, and comes to us as a, from a knowledge broker at the UBC uh, Faculty of Medicine in Physical Therapy. So we are going to find out, and I am going to let them introduce the whole concept of BC SPORE units. So with that, I turn the mic over to Sterling. Great, thank you very much, and thank you for coming along on uh, Black Friday, 
I think you made the right choice. Uh, at least I hope so. So we're going to talk about uh, methods matter and provide an update on uh, one aspect of the BC support unit, which is uh, uh, the, the piece that relates to, uh, to methods, uh, research methods and development of research methods, because that's a piece that we're particularly focused on. So I'm going to speak for parts. Alison's going to then come and join, and then uh, then we're going to switch uh, switch again. Good, welcome. Um, so we're going to talk first of all about just to make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of what we understand by patient-oriented research. Uh, we're going to talk about the methods clusters within the BC support unit, uh, what we've accomplished to date, uh, what's next on our our plans in terms of our plans and how folks can, uh, can get involved. So the strategy for patient-oriented research, SPOR, um, is the acronym. Uh, it's, uh, it's been implemented by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, but interestingly it isn't a CIHR strategy. So it's actually Canada's strategy for patient-oriented research. Um, and so it's actually funded directly by the federal government. So CIHR receives funding from federal government, but this is in addition to CIHR's regular budget. So if anyone's feeling that like, SPORE has been drawing money away from other uh, parts of CIHR, then, uh, then, then uh, rest assured that's not the case. Uh, this is actually additional funding to CIHR in order for the strategy to be implemented. And the strategy is broadly about ensuring that the right patients receive the right intervention at the right time, and increasing the amount of research being conducted with and by research knowledge users, and that includes patients and families, as well as healthcare providers and health system decision makers. So does anyone think that that's like a crazy idea? No. No, well, right, good, excellent. So everyone's on the same page in terms of thinking that SPORE is a good thing. Great. So one of the things that we're trying to achieve through the strategy um, and I should say that like, the strategy has many component pieces. So the support units are one of the component pieces. If you like, they're the infrastructure pieces of the strategy. So every province and territory has a support unit. I mean, not every province or territory has its own support unit, but there is a support unit that covers uh, each, uh, each province and territory. Uh, there are also national networks that you may be aware of. Um, uh, as well as uh, other sort of component parts of the, the strategy. So it's a partnership, it's a, a new partnership in Canadian health research where we're explicitly trying to bring together um, four component stakeholder groups, researchers, patients, care providers, and health system decision makers. So the strategy for patient-oriented research, uh, interestingly, isn't all about patients. Uh, I mean, patients are fundamentally uh, a key component piece of, uh, or people with lived experience, a, a, a fundamental key component piece of the strategy. But it's, it's actually a strategy that encompasses four uh, stakeholder groups. So uh, the emphasis is on ensuring that we're, li we're listening effectively to the voices of people with lived experience of conditions. But we also uh, have stakeholder groups that are to do with the providers of care, as well as the health system decision makers in addition to researchers. And what, one of the things that we're doing is actually recognizing that um, um, we have knowledge users who are both, uh, who, are, who are care providers, health system decision makers, and patients. And in fact, we're seeing patients as knowledge users. So recognizing that increasingly we're living in a world of, um, of, of, uh, of, of provision of care uh, self-care as well as uh, as well as care that is, is shared, uh, decision-making that is shared. So what do we mean by patient-oriented research? So making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and, and this is quite a high bar in some ways, but this is the bar that we're setting for a definition of patient-oriented research. It's, it's research that engages patients as partners. So that's the first fundamental piece, is to recognize that we're actually talking about people with lived experience, not only as subjects of health research, but actually as partners in research teams. So it's actually then ensuring that we're listening effectively 
to the voices of people with lived experience as partners in that research enterprise. We're focusing on patient-identified priorities, so we actually want to make sure that the agenda that is moving forward around health research is an agenda that people with lived experience can direct to, to a large extent. So we actually want to identify priorities, and part of the work that we've been trying to do is to support teams that are engaging with people with lived experience to say, what are the challenges that you face and what, is the, what are the gaps in terms of the research evidence that exists in relation to uh, the condition that you have or uh, the, the, the evidence base for, for you and for your condition. It's conducted by multi multidisciplinary teams. So it is a partnership of stakeholder groups. So those four stakeholder groups that, we, that I, I referred to previously. And it aims to obviously apply the knowledge to improve the healthcare system and to improve healthcare practice. So that's what we mean by patient-oriented research. So to, to, to be truly patient-oriented, you have to have people with lived experience as partners in your research team. You need to be addressing priorities that have been identified by people with lived experience. You need to be conducting the research in partnership with people with lived experience, i.e. patients, um, people who are in decision-making positions, and people who are uh, clinicians as well as the researchers, and then you need to be trying to ensure that you improve, so the knowledge translation piece about improving the healthcare system. So it's quite a high bar to be doing truly patient-oriented research, and we're obviously trying to move people in that direction without necessarily saying, we're not interested unless you um, um, meet all four of those criteria. So the, um, the, the methods clusters is one component piece within the BC support unit, and Alison will uh, talk about the distinction that we make between uh, the service side of the support unit and the, uh, the, the knowledge um, uh, development or the, the methods development piece. So in terms of the support unit uh, uh, methods clusters, the mandate for the methods clusters, so I, I should say that no other support unit actually has something called methods clusters. So, I mean, the, 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 the mandate for the methods clusters within the BC support unit is to advance the evidence base of the scientific methods used within the context of patient-oriented research. So that's what we're trying to do, is actually advance the evidence base of the methods used in patient-oriented research. So I, I find that this is, I'm sure you're going to share this, like an incredibly exciting agenda. Like we've now got an opportunity, and we have an opportunity in BC, to advance methods. So actually to do research on how to do patient-oriented research well. And I've struggled in my, my career to find where we can actually get solid funding to do research on methods. And I think this is an opportunity for us to embrace the, uh, uh, the, 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 the four strategy in order to do high quality methods research. So that's what we're trying to do, is advance the methods. And so we've got three goals for the, for the, for the support unit overall. Building capacity to conduct and implement high quality patient oriented research across the province. So this is, this is a truly provincial initiative. We've got uh, a hub that's based in Vancouver, but we've got regional centers in all of the regional health authorities. Um, and uh, second is about increasing the quality and the impact of patient-oriented research across BC. So part of the work on in improving the quality is the methods cluster piece. We're actually trying to ensure that we've got high quality methods that allow us to do patient-oriented research well. And then we've got, we want to ensure ongoing support for patient-oriented research in all regions of the province. So those are the goals overall for the support unit, the mandate for the methods clusters in particular, um, uh, is around advancing the science and promoting the use of the knowledge that's generated. So we've got knowledge translation built into the work we're doing within the methods clusters. So we want to do methods research that has impact in terms of improving the quality of patient-oriented research that's done. And we want to promote the field 
uh, of research. We want to promote um, uh, patient-oriented research. So we've got methods cluster leadership. Um, so, so we've got six clusters that we've launched so far. Um, uh, I've got ambition for more, but we don't have any money for more at this point. So, so we've, we've, we've uh, exhausted our ability to, uh, to go beyond the six at this point, but uh, we've, we certainly hope that uh, in the next stage of the, uh, the, the strategy, there may be opportunity to go beyond this. So we started with knowledge translation and implementation science. So uh, Linda Lee is our lead for that, advised by Bev Holmes. Um, the next one we launched uh, was, I think, the Real World Clinical Trials. Um, and uh, our very own Hubert Wong is our lead for, uh, for that. Uh, and obviously, you all know Hubert well. Uh, we've got health economics and simulation modeling that uh, Nick Bansback, who's uh, here with us, and uh, will take questions, I'm sure, at some point, uh, if need be. Uh, and he shares that leadership with David Whitehurst, who's uh, in the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. Uh, then we have data science and health informatics that uh, Leanne Curry uh, leads. Uh, she's in the School of Nursing here at UBC uh, and is advised by, again, our very own Kim McGrail. And Erin uh, Mahalik leads our patient engagement uh, methods cluster. And Rick Sawatsky leads the patient-centered measurements cluster. Uh, advised by uh, Lena Cuthbertson. So those are our six clusters, and we have leads in place. And these are people who are seconded to commit time to this leadership role. So these people have a day a week that they uh, are uh, seconded to support uh, this, uh, this, this initiative. So one of the things that I found, like when I first started in this role, which was now back in uh, 2016, so, so over two years ago, I read this review, which I found uh, like uh, insightful, but almost rather scary, uh, because it's a review looking at patient engagement in research. So patient-oriented research is fundamentally about engaging patients as partners in health research. Um, and so I thought, well, like, let's go to literature. What do we know? Fabulous. There's a recently, uh, recently conducted systematic review. We all believe in systematic reviews. Uh, I was teaching earlier in the week on how to do systematic reviews uh, as part of the SPPH course. So fabulous that we've got a systematic review on how to engage patients in research. And this was the conclusion that research dedicated to identifying the best methods to achieve engagement is lacking and clearly needed. So in fact, like, we may want to engage patients as partners in health research, but the guidance from the literature on how to do that, and how to do that well, is actually very thin. There's actually very little that actually has been done by way of methods research. So, so I mean, I fundamentally believe this is the right approach. I fundamentally believe that we should be listening effectively to, um, and respectfully to people with lived experience to guide us not only in what we research, but in how we conduct that research, but actually understanding how we can do that well. And I used the phrase of like avoiding wasting people's time, because I'm, I'm an economist. Like I, I, I can't not be an economist. Like I've got an economics hat on all the time. Um, and so I'm conscious about the efficiency of process. And like, you know, I, I, what I see is that you know, you, we're potentially bringing people to sit around a table uh, as part of a research team and not be clear about what role it is that we're asking them to play, what the contribution is that they can make, um, and I think we need, we, need, we, need, we need guidance on that. And so that's why we've set up a, a method cluster that's specifically on patient engagement, so that we can actually generate some evidence that says, how can we do this well? And not only how can we do it well, how can we ensure that we're actually listening to a diverse range of opinions? Because again, one of the dangers in this area, I think, and the thing that like keeps me up at night, is that we end up listening effectively to the voices of people who already have a pretty loud voice. So, so that's that's I think like a real danger that we have if we're not careful is that we end up actually just giving louder voices to those people who already have a pretty loud voice, and, and the people who have a pretty loud voice tend to look a bit like me. 
or possibly more like Alison. <laughs> So, 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 you know, I think, I think that's, that is something that we need to be very conscious of, and we are trying to then be conscious of that in the work we go forward with. So I'm now going to pass over to Alison, and then I'll come back and talk a bit more of it later. I might not need this because I have a loud voice, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. So uh, what I uh, thought might be helpful to give a little bit of perspective is, uh, in the support unit, how we're organized, because um, the methods clusters are one aspect of the support unit, but it's kind of like you have your right arm and your left arm, and you need them uh, both working together to be able to do things effectively. So on the right side, well, my right side, um, we have the doing of research, the doing of patient-oriented research. And this is the service delivery side of the support unit. So for individual researchers in the audience, um, if you have a project that you are looking to porify, uh, to move more to a patient-oriented research lens with those criteria that uh, Sterling went over, um, then you can fill out the inquiry form on our webpage uh, that will direct you to services no matter where you are in BC. Um, regardless of what region of BC, to help you with uh, data, knowledge translation, patient engagement. Uh, we can help you with a whole number of services. However, as Sterling identified earlier in that, from that systematic review, we also need to study how to do patient-oriented research better. And that's the methods cluster side of the support unit. Um, and as articulated earlier, there isn't uh, a model that has been available from different support units across the country to guide us on how to do this. So what I'm gonna share with you now is how we went about the process. So first of all, how did we establish the clusters and how did we establish the projects that um, uh, are undertaken by each of the clusters? Well, it started with consultations. And those consultations, were, you saw that there are six different methods clusters. How those consultations were undertaken by each cluster uh, was driven by the flavor of the cluster. So um, they all involved uh, key informant consultations. They all involved an expression of interest and a survey, kind of get a lay of the land, like a scoping review of what's currently uh, occurring in BC in each of those areas, in health economic, economics and data science, uh, in patient engagement, in KT, and in real world clinical trials. Uh, patient engagement also did a tweet chat. Um, the term focus groups is probably not the best term to use here because it's not data collection, it's consultation, okay? So it was trying to establish what is currently occurring and where the gaps are and could we identify themes specifically related to methods advancements within each of those six domains. From that material then, we drew together visioning or planning workshops where we brought stakeholders together from around the province, representing all four of those stakeholder groups. That was done for five of six of the clusters. The final cluster that has been launched is patient-centered measurement under Dr. Rit Sawatsky. And instead of having a single visioning event, uh, they're moving through each region of BC and doing consultations specifically with patient partners on one day and the other three stakeholder um, groups on the second day. So there's really extensive consultation that was undertaken in each of the clusters, and particularly in patient-centered uh, measurement, in order to make sure that we are bringing everyone to the table who wants to be at the table. Um, after the workshops, it's not always possible for people to come together. We know that. So we had to uh, establish a mechanism for those that, who couldn't attend in person to also uh, get access to what was discussed uh, and what was shared. Um, and so that was done through uh, webinars and other discussions. From that, themes were developed. So within each of the clusters, 
there were specific themes that resonated across the stakeholder groups. We went out and validated again with all the stakeholders that were part of the consultations and said, okay, this is what we think we heard. Is this what, uh, is this an accurate representation of what you shared with us? From that then, the next process, as opposed to uh, what you would normally see in, uh, in a research realm where there's a call um, for grant, uh, grant funding and it's a competitive process where everybody submits proposals and they're ranked and the best ones are funded. The approach in the methods clusters is a collaborative one to bring communities of methodologists together. So they collectively identify what are the methods where the opportunities are to advance methods. And then we ask people to put up their hands, anyone in the province, and say, would you like to lead a project? Would you like to collaborate on a project? Or would you like to be kept informed of a project? And then help to de uh, develop proposals that are um, developed iteratively with um, the leads of the clusters, the advisors of the clusters, with the scientific director, once those projects then are initially developed, so uh, if we go through the consultations, those consultations were uh, how did we identify these people through a widespread call, through a targeted call, and through snowballing. The visioning and planning events, we look for representation by region and level of expertise. The webinars, as I said, for those who couldn't attend. And then the Data was analyzed from consultations, the themes were validated, and then how did we pick the potential projects? So people submitted ideas for potential projects. Were there criteria for which projects were moved forward? Yes, and those criteria were based on, they had to align with CIHR core criteria. There had to be buy-in from the stakeholders, they had to be able to produce applicable results. They had to fulfill four training objectives. So there had to be a, um, a trainee component to each of the projects. They had to fit within the required budget. Um, and there had to be, hopefully, the potential for uh, intercluster uh, collaboration. So all of those consultations, that entire process, has been documented and is on the web page for each of the clusters. So if you're interested in health economics or you're interested in KT or you're interested in real world clinical trials, you can go to that specific web page and read about that entire process, what the themes were, what the projects were moved forward um, by looking at our web page. Uh, this is a representation of what was done for the patient engagement methods cluster. So they did the online survey, we did interviews and focus groups with 38 people. We had the visioning workshop with 51 people. We did a tweet chat, uh, and we did the webinar. And then we bring, keep bringing that back in the true spirit of complete um, transparency to share what we're learning and to co-develop the projects. So once the project proposals are developed, which is done iteratively using a modified template similar to what you're familiar with from CIHR. The next thing is for those projects, even though it's not a competitive process, we want to ensure that there's rigor in their development. So those are internally reviewed by the Science Council. And the Science Council is composed of all the leads, uh, the advisors, the scientific director, uh, and myself. So those are internally reviewed in the, in the Science Council and strengthened, identifying areas where there's opportunity to um, enrich those, and then sent for external review to two to three reviewers outside of BC who are asked to provide, again, a lens not to approve whether these are moving forward, but to identify opportunities to strengthen them. Once that's been undertaken, the projects com commence, and then, based on the doing side of the support unit, each of the teams that are undertaking projects are supported through the support unit for patient engagement, for KT, um, all the services that we provide at the support unit.
So where are we now? If we had to map this out, this entire process, and look at each of those methods clusters, where are we? So defining scope, consultations, themes, project ideas, developing the teams, developing the proposals, developing the work plan, internal external review, and launching the projects. Three clusters have completed the, uh, all of those stages for their first round of projects. And two of them, real world clinical trials and health economics and simulation modeling are in their second round of projects that are more uh, moving through. The data science and health informatics methods cluster is currently putting together, uh, finalizing their project proposals and developing their work plan. The patient engagement methods cluster, which started a little later, uh, is um, finalizing its project teams. And the PCM methods cluster, patient-centered measurement, is still doing its consultations. Okay. So what's being accomplished? That's looking at it from on the scale of the steps that we've been through, the process that we've been through. We have launched, this was an infographic from our Putting Patients First uh, conference uh, that was held in October. And we have now launched, if you look at this final column, the current status, 12 projects. There's over 60 stakeholders representing those four stakeholder groups that are a part of collectively of these projects. Are compensating for about $1.3 million of funding thus far. Uh, we have uh, teams uh, that include people from all of the regions of BC. Uh, and from four of the universities, and from even outside of BC. Uh, the projects that are still in development, that are moving forward, have expanded that even more so. So there's significant intent uh, to make sure that we're getting the diversity and the representation uh, that we're aiming for. So, to Sterling. Great, thank you very much. So what I wanted to we wanted to do also was just give you a sense of some of the topics that, have, uh, that are moving forward for the project. So what we've listed here, uh, just, the, just the, the, not, not even full titles, but just to give you a, a, a sense of some of the topics that are being funded through the, the methods clusters. And these are just the ones that have, have been launched to date. So these all relate to uh, knowledge translation and implementation science. So we've got uh, a project uh, in the north on her hermeneutic approach in implementation science. I have to admit that I didn't even know that hermeneutic was a word before uh, that proposal came forward. Um, and it's got nothing to do with biblical uh, um, uh, um, text, uh, I can assure you. But that's what uh, seems to be uh, Wikipedia, which of course is where everyone goes first to, to understand something. Um, system thinking tools, so actually using uh, assistance thinking approach to, uh, to knowledge translation. Consensus, how do we actually derive or arrive at uh, a consensus um, uh, and, and it would, in relation to integrated knowledge translation? So methods for consensus, um, um, achieving consensus. And, and actually there's a, there's a project uh, uh, on documentary as a method of KT. So actually like using a documentary approach and how effective can documentary be? And I'll talk a bit more about citizen science. So the citizen science project is actually one of the projects that we're taking forward across methods clusters. Um, these then uh, in blue are the projects that relate to the real world clinical trials. Uh, so we're using the language of real world clinical trials because that's what is language that CIHR uses. You might be more familiar with pragmatic clinical trials. So it's about how do we ensure that clinical trials uh, have direct relevance uh, produce evidence that has direct relevance to uh, decision making in the healthcare system. Uh, so there's work on statistical efficiency, specifically in the context of doing real world clinical trials. We've got work on causal inference methods, uh, as well as uh, in, um, listening to patients uh, and getting patient values that can actually uh, be direct inputs into uh, the approach that's adopted in conducting clinical trials. And then these are projects in the health economics and simulation modeling cluster that have moved forward. So we've got work on value-based decisions. So the decisions that are made when you're actually designing health economic studies, 
uh, what is the value base of those decisions and have some reflections on that. Um, economics and clinical study design, so actually having um, um, a, a, a lens of economics when you're thinking about designing clinical studies. And then uh, videos, uh, educational videos. So how do we actually uh, communicate effectively with a lay audience around the work of uh, health economists, which uh, is, is critically important work. So the citizen science project, I'll just say something very briefly about that. This is a project that's actually coming from, uh, from three of the clusters. Um, so knowledge translation, implementation science, uh, um, patient engagement, and uh, data science and health informatics. So those three clusters have come together. And we're actually trying, we're, what we're gonna be doing with the citizen science project is creating a platform. That, we, that then is available for others to use, where people can like use it to, to record data. So if, so if you've got a hunch, so like the, the best example uh, that I have for citizen science, uh, or the, the one that I find most compelling as, a, as, a, as an example, is the, uh, the project that's been done in the UK called Cloudy with a Chance of Pain. Um, and if you like, just Google Cloudy with a Chance of Pain, you'll go straight to that website. Um, and this is people with arthritis. And the, the, the hunch, of course, is, like, is the pain worse when it tends to be cloudy? And that's sort of like, is it an old wives' tale, or is there some uh, truth to that? So like, how do we explore that? We create an app, people can download on their phone, and record their pain using a, using a, a, a scale, uh, and they allow the GPS link to, so you can establish what the weather was. And so you've got this, this enormous database then that can address that question, and that's what they're doing with Cloudy with a Chance of Pain. So we're trying to create something in DC that's available for others to use. And it may be available like, for, for someone who's got a hunch, someone who lives their life with a chronic condition, who has a hunch about uh, uh, like why, their, why their symptoms might be worse at a particular point in time. Like, like allow people then to take that hunch forward if it seems a plausible hunch. Uh, so in fact, what we're focusing on at the moment is creating a platform that would allow people to uh, have a, a place to record symptoms, any sort of symptoms. Um, and, and, that they, um, and, and we'll work with them to, uh, to try and then uh, um, offer uh, an opportunity for that hunch to be explored. So that's the, the nature of this sort of citizen science project that we want to, to go forward with. But we're not, we're trying to make it a, a generic platform that would then be available for, for people to use. Um, and it could be from any of those stakeholder groups, including people with lived experience. So patient engagement themes. So these are um, the themes that have come through just to give you a flavor uh, particularly from our patient engagement methods cluster. So uh, we haven't got projects that are approved yet within this cluster, but these are the general themes that are, are coming through. Uh, so patient priority setting, so how do we ensure that we're doing patient priority setting well? So what are the topics that we should be moving forward? Harnessing digital technologies, so how do we ensure that we're effectively uh, gonna be uh, uh, using digital tech, digital health technologies, and obviously that uh, the citizen science project would be one example of that. And then methods and evaluation for the recruitment. So how do we actually ensure that we're recruiting a diverse group of people, for example, uh, as well as being clear about the role that we're asking people to play. So when we're asking someone to be a partner in a health in, in a research team as someone with lived experience. We need to be crystal clear on the role we're asking people to play. Are we asking people to represent people with that condition? I mean, I would say like that's an impossible ask. It seems, it seems unfair to bring someone in and say, you're here to be the voice of all people with that condition, unless you support people to actually play that role effectively. So I think if we're asking people to be representatives of people with a particular diagnosis, then we need to support them very effectively in order to be truly able to, to play that role. I never see myself on a team as a representative of the health economics community. Because I think I'm probably like at a bit of a, I'm not, I'm not quite in the middle of the distribution of views of, of health economists, and so, so I think it would be unfair to ask me to be a representative of the health economics community. And so I think we need to be very clear on 
the role that we're asking people to play. And then patient-centered measurement, um, we're, I think um, um, Alison outlined the work that's going forward to uh, engage with the community. This was, this was the last cluster that we started, and, uh, and, and Rick and Lena have taken a different approach and, and have, have gone out and are running these workshops at the moment. So in terms of how to get involved, um, so if, if you're uh, uh, keen to get involved, then there's still opportunity to get involved. Um, we're, we're obviously pushing many of the projects forward now, um, and in fact, but we've got still got some projects that are in development, and I know that we've got one or two people here who are leading on projects, so it's great to see uh, folks uh, uh, engaged in the process, but we've got other work that we, we, we're moving forward, and there will be other opportunities to uh, to be part of the, uh, the, the, the projects that move forward. So, um, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, else? I yeah. just wanted, sorry, um, to take the opportunity for those of you that might be interested in moving your own projects forward and how you could get support through the support unit, uh, that we ran a very um, well attended uh, course uh, before the workshop called Tools for Poor which is designed specifically for researchers, trainees, and research support personnel, where we share with uh, you a number of, we curate over 130 resources to help resor uh, researchers undertake patient-oriented research better. And this is a three-hour workshop that we're putting on again on December the 6th and you can register on it uh, for it on our website. So if you want more actual tools, like what method should I be using? How should I be evaluating? How should I be budgeting for patient partners? If, this is, if you want a how-to and some tools that you can select from, uh, please sign up for that course on December 6th. And I should say that it's led by the uh, wonderful Alison Holmes, uh, and, uh, and it's free to, uh, to to attend. You need to register, but there's no there's no fee to attend. And there's food. And there's food. <laughs> Good. I think we are open for questions. If that's okay. okay, so we are going to open for questions, but we're going to start with an online. We always give them precedence. Um, a person writes in, and they're saying um, there's. Uh, um, GIN, Guidelines International Network, which you did not mention, and is also an evidence-based toolkit for public engagement. Uh, are there any comments that you'd like to make about that? Yeah, I mean, there are many uh, examples of, uh, of, of uh, guidelines for doing public, uh, public and patient engagement, uh, uh, and there are, there are many centers. I mean, there's a great center in Quebec that focuses entirely on uh, patient and public engagement. So yeah, there are guidelines. I and mean, what I was pointing to was was the evidence base that supports those guidelines is be is 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 is, uh, is is I think a little thin at this point. So I wouldn't say like don't use those guidelines. But I think what we're trying to do is actually strengthen those guidelines by actually providing an evidence base to support the statements that are made. That was wonderful. I've got a much better idea of the work you've been doing um, lately. Uh, I guess for this audience, um, uh, can you tell us how SPORE might fit with sort of population health and prevention where we don't necessarily have members of a defined illness group or symptom complex. It may be that I want to get Craig off the couch or me eating my vegetables and that's the objective of what we're doing. So how do we how do, we do patient-oriented research in population health? Great. This is a great way of actually ensuring that you get your physical activity. <laughs> so I yeah, can see that it's designed well for this, this audience. Um, so I, I think it's a really important point, and I think we've got like hung up on the patient word, and, and it's been problematic, and it's been problematic for many reasons. And I, you know, I, I think that, you know we we don't have an option to move away from using that word, but I think you know we we feel uncomfortable sometimes using that word uh, because we're also talking with. Indigenous communities, for example, um, where community-based research and actually it's it's research that's you know where we engage with a community, which I think is is uh, you know speaks a little bit to, to, to your direction as well. 
And I think we definitely want to say that this is inclusive. We don't want to say this is just about people with uh, a label, uh, a diagnosis. Um, you know, I think there is a public health um, um, aspect to the work we're doing. And if we take, say, for example, a citizen science piece of work, um, then I think that could potentially become a platform that would be available to do public health uh, research as well, uh, where people have a hunch. And it may not necessarily be a hunch that is to do with their, their symptoms, which is where we're focusing at the moment, but it could be a hunch to do with like, how can we more effectively get people engaged in physical activity? And you've got like a, you know, a, a hypothesis that you feel is worthy of, a, of exploration. Uh, that we potentially then might be able to, to, to use that platform for. So definitely, I think it's fair to say, at the moment, the focus has been on uh, mainly chronic, chronic uh, uh, people with chronic conditions. Um, and so I think the patient word is, has been, uh, has been where, where our emphasis has been to date. But I think we definitely want and feel, I mean, I certainly feel it's important that we are broader than that, and, and uh, we want public health to be, to be part of the work that we do. We do currently, one of the projects that is launched is about a toolkit of systems thinking tools. Um, and that's in the public domain, working with uh, community neighborhood houses to help inform decision making that occurs uh, within the community. And so patient is not the term there. CIHR, the term patient is meant to be inclusive of families and friends and public and, uh, be much more broad uh, and we do uh, say replace that word with anything that is pertinent to the people that you're working with um, and uh, meaningful to them. Hi, Alison Stone. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, my question, um, having been doing this research myself and trying to engage communities um, in my work, is the struggle with the time and the cost issue. So I'm just curious about hearing your reflections. If you think one of the outcomes of all this work being done across Canada is going to be to change the way CHR might think about timelines and money and so on to enable it, because it's really extended my timelines you struggle with cost issues, to do it in a very meaningful way. So I'd just be interested in hearing your reflections on that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Sue. That's a, uh, I think a criti critically important question. And I mean, I think at the moment there's no question. But my experience has been um, that, like, you know, we, we have, there's, been, there's been some pretty long meetings that we've had to have and repeated meetings in order to really explain to individuals what it is that we're asking them, what role we're asking them to play, um, and, and then spending time listening to, to people tell their stories, which is fundamentally, I think, like a critically important sort of first step in, in doing patient-oriented research well, is actually truly uh, spending time listening and giving people an opportunity to tell their story. Um, yeah, that's a time-consuming activity. Um, so, like, you know, I, I think it, no, no question. There's a cost issue and there's a resource issue. Um, I mean, from a CIHR point of view, it's a legitimate expense, like to have patients to actually reimburse patient people uh, um, uh, for the time that they commit to these activities. But from a researcher point of view, you know, you could argue that you're actually, you know, you've got a, a, a more costly process in terms of the commitment of your time. I mean, my reflection on this is that I, I, I think that this is like a, you know, when we actually do have some have an evidence base that sort of can guide us more effectively, then perhaps we're going to be wasting less time. I think there is waste of time at the moment, um, and I think we need to reflect upon that and how do we ensure we're not wasting time. But I think ultimately it is a time-intensive process. But, you know, from my point of view, well, what's the alternative? Uh, do we then say, actually, like, let, let's just, like, pursue our own research agenda, period. Uh, we're not really interested in an agenda that is driven by people who uh, live their lives with the conditions in question. I mean, my, my, my sort of, you know, I'm trained in economics, and actually like, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this, is because of my economics training. You know, like the, the consumer sovereignty 
is, is critical to me. Like, you know, the people who use health services, the people who suffer health conditions, the people who potentially might benefit are the people that should drive the agenda. And I fundamentally believe that. So for me, there isn't an alternative to say, let's move away and do something completely different. Because uh, I think this is fundamentally the right thing to do. But we need to make sure we're doing it in, a, in an efficient way. And that's part of why we need this evidence base to be generated. So one, one quick thing. Um, I was at the Spore Summit last week, and Michael Strong, who's the new president of CIHR, uh, he made a very, very strong case to say that he now understands and believes that patient-oriented research is the right approach to adopt, even for his own work. Um, he said, he was quoted as saying, uh, there isn't a stronger supporter of SPORE in the room than Michael Strong. And I probably saw that on Twitter, probably, because I was Yeah, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, in terms of what we're hearing from other researchers, we are hearing that. It's, it's um, you know, how do we do this more efficiently? because there is the concern that it does take more time and more effort. Uh, from a KT point of view, so it's kind of nice from health and economics and, and knowledge translation, um, you know, we might be able to do things as we traditionally, many have traditionally been doing that, where uh, it's end of grant KT, rather than the integrated knowledge translation, where people are partnering on the research team. There's a lot, an awful lot of overlap between patient-oriented research and integrated knowledge translation. And one can argue, of course, that um, perhaps it is more efficient in the long run uh, because you have a, um, you're aiming towards greater implementation and adoption of those findings. Thank you very much. I, too, have a much better understanding of the work that you're doing, so very helpful. I must admit, I have thought about including, um, in my case, workers in research. When the study is more like, is this treatment better, is this policy better, I hadn't thought about including people in methods development in that way. So I'm interested in trying to understand that, how to engage somebody, say for example in your econometrics cluster or your simulation cluster involving a patient in that kind of project in a meaningful way, um, as opposed to, I've always thought about it as treatment or policy, I, am I clear in what I'm, in, in the actual methods clusters, like in those projects engaging patients in methods development is intriguing to me and I'm trying to understand what that might look like. So, Nick, do you want to just like give a quick first answer to that, or I'm happy to. So, yeah, I think I need to say we're still learning, and, um, but just an, an observation, perhaps, from the projects that we've got going. Um, the way that the patient partners are critical team members. Um, just, I'm going to give one example, and there's many more, so I don't want you to think it's just the one. But many of the researchers on the teams have this tendency to overcomplicate. And actually, in our methods, <laughs> in our asks of, of patients, we develop these tools or these questionnaires or these things that we're going to then go and ask patients to do for good, when in good reasons and intentions. But a patient partner just says, uh, wait a minute, are you this, if you ask this, you're just gonna get an educated um, uh, patient who are gonna be able to respond to this. And if you truly want to get a voice of everyone, we're gonna have to cut the number of questions, you're gonna have to make the language much simpler and I think even folk from, from a methods point of view, they, we are already seeing that they are crucial members who just ask that question and challenge us. And when that happens, you look around each other and you're, we're all like, yeah, we, we, we get that. So I think they can play many more roles than that, but just even that, that, that place of 
asking and keeping you um, realistic about what you can be doing from the methods. I think even for highly sort of complicated econometrics, we're not expecting them to be running the analysis with that data, but that data collection even is a crucial thing. And another thing I would say actually on that topic is that we're learning. You know, like we're, we're, we're fundamentally believers in a patient-oriented research approach. And so we've, we've applied that lens to doing the method work. We've made it a requirement that every project has people with lived experience as a team member. And we're actually doing an evaluation. Like that's part of what we're doing, is now we're gonna have a case series, if you like, of uh, that uh, being attempted. Like what has worked, what has not worked so well. You know, and, and so we're going to be reflecting with the patient partners on that so that we can um, try, and, try and do better going forward. So in terms of the evaluation, there's also a scale that's being developed, um, the patient engagement in research scale, uh, which we're, has gone through some preliminary uh, validation. This is uh, one of Dr. Linda Lee's um, postdoctoral students, uh, Dr. Clayon Hamilton. Uh, and that's being utilized within the unit uh, as, a, as a way of evaluating it. But in, in terms of roles that patients can play, uh, one of the common things that we're hearing from people is, well, what do we ask our patient partners to do? And do we ask them at the beginning to fill a certain role? Uh, and the patient partners are saying, how do we know what we should be doing? Uh, and that's where some of the tools that are currently available to help guide those discussions have been really excellent. So for example, in that Tools for Poor course, um, at each phase in the research cycle, whether it's uh, designing the study, data collection, data analysis, uh, interpretation of the findings, there are a number of roles that have been utilized, identified for patients at each of those phases. And ideally then, you can say, you can sit down, have the discussion with your patient partners and say, here are some options of things, what speaks to you? And don't forget that patients come with more than their condition. They come with their occupation. So in the health economics clusters, there's a, a, one of the patient partners has actually got a passion for health economics. There's a mathematician who wants to be involved in the real world clinical trials. So we can't make the assumption that uh, patients can't contribute uh, in ways beyond their lived experience. Wow, pretty amazing. Anyway, um, I just put, fell out of my chair when I heard that this is really the only methods cluster in Canada. Yes? Um, yeah, well, you can that. Anyway, and I have a question for you. I, but it, it seemed to me I heard that and I thought, wow, what an opportunity for BC. So now I'll get into my question. Um, and kind of building on what Sue said, um, the, it seems to me that talking to patients and eliciting their experiences and stories is a huge part of this. And it surprises me that within the methods cluster, where I'm not seeing more methods development about qualitative and mixed methods approaches. Because it seems to me these are so very critical to the methods. And, and what I see is some very traditional, the way we've done things before. So can you speak to the prospect of uh, qualitative and mixed methods as a, a place to play? First of all, the methods clusters, uh, yes, they don't exist in any of the other support units, and credit has to go to Sterling. When the initial work plan went out for the BC support unit, it was the vision of Sterling uh, to do that. Um, and many of our projects do involve both qualitative and quantitative. You might not see that in the titles, but if you go into the actual uh, methods, and uh, for each, um, cluster of the three of the 12 projects we've done a webinar where the project leads provided the um, some details of the methods <coughs> so, so just on the like is this a, the only province group that's doing this so other provinces have platforms in methods but this is the only 
support unit that has a particular emphasis on methods of development. So actually like funding projects that are explicitly about methods, um, methods of advancement. So um, in terms of like, yeah, so I, I think that's important just to, to, to recognize. Um, in terms of like, should we have something on mixed methods? Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm a convert over recent years. And I've said publicly that I never want to do a project that's not a mixed methods project ever again. Um, so I, I believe fundamentally in uh, the combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches uh, as being such a powerful tool. I want there to be a mixed methods you know, you know, uh, uh, cluster, and there should be a mixed methods cluster. And I, I, uh, yeah, I've probably got an extra grey hair or two because there's not because uh, I. Feel that uh, that this is uh, this is an, an omission, and it's the first thing that I think we'll fix if we uh, get a second tranche of funding. One last question. I think you. I think that was that was really interesting. I'm, I'm also really interested in involving effective communities and measurements and and methods. One one question that I have is, if we really are truly going to do citizen science. And obviously, as researchers, we have our own agendas, we have our own expertise. Is there, is there, is CHR providing funding that we can involve citizens and patients and affected communities from the very, very beginning and having it be truly their projects that they come up with as opposed to ours and then we involve them later? I mean, I, I, I personally believe the answer is yes. Um, I, and I think the more we can actually push this forward, I think there's, I don't think there's a, there's a sort of uh, um, a pushback against this at CIHR. If anything, I think there's an embracing of this at CIHR. I mean, there's, there's definitely like, there's definitely been like, you know, negative stuff said about sport within a CIHR context. And, you know, I think we now have a president who has fundamentally endorsed the strategy and wants to move forward with this strategy. So I think that's exactly what we should see. I mean, I've just spent a couple of days doing reviews of grants for CIHR, um, and actually there was, there was not that much on the health services research panel that was of this approach, and I think that's disappointing. So I think we should be trying to, to, to push this forward. And I, I, I think there is receptivity and willingness to talk this way uh, and to have this sort of approach uh, that, that can get funded through CIHR. With that, thank you all for attending and join with me in thanking today's speakers, Sterling and Madison. Have a great day, and the next Grand Rounds will be in January. So 
show prims, prawns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not as for Well, no, I would say it's more risky in colors. So this is a much Um, 